All right, I've turned my mic on. The room, good, you can hear me. All right, then I think we're about ready to start. Thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Ben. Uh, this talk is not about type design, which was tagged in the program, so sorry about that. Uh, however, it is about in-place construction, something that a C++, a C++ programmer of one week's experience can understand the idea of, but of 10 years' experience can still find tricky. And it's based on, I, I developed this talk maybe 18 months ago based on seeing a lot of code in a relatively large code bases where engineers were trying to, of all kinds of skill levels, were trying to adopt modern features, were trying to use things like in place or in place back, or you know, were trying to get that efficiency that C++, as C++ programmers we want, uh, but falling into pitfalls, you know, not quite getting it right, or rather, or, or maybe a refactoring would would change things up and cause what was good code to become, you know, not so good code. So please ask questions as we go. This is what we're going to cover. I'll either answer it on the spot or defer it to a future slide if I'm going to cover the point. <clears throat> First of all, I want to ask who here is using, let's say, at least C++ 98? Hopefully everyone, yes. All right, at least, at least 11. Keep your hands up, just drop them. At least 11, pretty much everyone. At least 14? Okay, mostly, most people are 14, at least 17. Okay, so that's the big break point. Uh, and anyone using like bleeding edge, like beyond 17 as, as, as much as their compilers can support. Great. Okay, so most of, there's even some parts of this which are applicable to 98. It's pretty much all applicable to post 11. And you'll see that star in the corner. Uh, whenever you see a, a slide with code on it, that star indicates uh, which version of C++ I'm talking about. Although many of, the, many of the slides that are on 17, if you're on 14, you'll find that there are applicable things to 14. Okay, let's get started. I'll also be, how did this come out? Can everyone read that? My syntax highlighting is a, is a constant battle. Yeah, if we could dim the lights a little bit, it might help. Anyway, this class is something you might have seen uh, if you've watched Jason Turner's you know, C CPP uh, weekly. Uh, it's just a noisy class that tells us whenever any of the special member functions get called. And you're gonna see this a lot, uh, use of this a lot later. So in particular, I've outfitted this class with pretty much all the special member functions we, sh we could want, and importantly, multiple constructors, some of which are explicit, some of which are multi-arg. Um, so, so hopefully this covers most use cases that you would find in, in code bases of your own. All right, so let's first of all talk a little bit about uh, what happens when things get moved. Because I had this realization, I don't know, a, a year or two years ago, Moving from a string usually isn't any faster than copying it. And if, you, if you're wondering, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're wondering, are doubting that, then think about the reason why we have the small string optimization. Most strings are small, which means most strings go in the small string buffer, which means mostly when we move a string, it's gonna be moving a small string, which is gonna be the same as a copy and all three major STL implementations actually will zero out, the, or I should say write a zero, so make the length zero of the move from string. So it's slightly less efficient sometimes to move a string than to copy it. <laughs> and uh, let's see if I can make this quick bench thing work. Uh, if I go to there and show you that tab, <coughs> You can see there that the copy was slightly faster than the move for a small string, about 20% faster in this case. Now, you know, benchmarks are always micro benchmarks. So, and this varies with the compiler and the, the libc plus and the standard library implementation you use. But it's just a sort of surprising thing, perhaps. All right, let's go back to the name here. 
Okay, so <clears throat> why is RVO so important? Moves aren't necessarily cheap. We saw that a string move isn't necessarily cheap. Here is an example where actually RVO does happen in this case. So the return value optimization, that is also known as copy elision. Phone book is a map. We're returning it. Hopefully we're getting RVO. And in this case, indeed we are. However, if we were not, this would be a move mandated from C++11. The compiler is required to try and move the thing if it can't copy a line. And if you're using Microsoft's STL, a map is a node-based container which needs a stable end iterator, which means that its move constructor must allocate. So if you accidentally don't get RVO and you incur a move, you'll get an allocation. And that's, well, pretty much rule one of optimization is don't incur allocations when you don't need to. This tweet by Billy O'Neill. <coughs> So RVO is really important. Um, so let's talk about it. Probably the most important optimization your compiler does, and so important that even though it's only been mandated on our values since C++ 17, all compilers, all production compilers of any, of any note, certainly all competitive production compilers have done it for literally decades. Uh, I, was, I was trying to find out uh, when it started happening uh, I asked Jason Turner, he can't find a compiler in history. It gets, it gets very difficult to run compilers before about 95. Uh, but um, I did find that named RVO went into GC, GCC 3.1. That was about around 2000-ish. And this is how RVO works, just a quick uh, recap. So when a caller calls into a callee, there's this, there's this extra hidden parameter, which is the address of the return value. Here it's ampersand s in the callee stack frame. <clears throat> and if the callee can return, can construct what it's going to return directly in the caller stack frame, here s, there is no need for it to construct and then copy at the point of return. So a here represents what, what would happen in the non-RVO case. Normally, without RVO, you'd construct, and then at the return, you'd copy or, or move now. Uh, but when you can construct it directly, in the caller stack frame, that's RVO. So now that you all know that, no, keeping that picture in mind allows us to think about when, you know, exactly how to make our RVO happen, and in particular, how, uh, how we can accidentally inhibit RVO. So there are two things to consider, what the standard says and what's possible. And the standard says uh, that we have to return either a temporary guaranteed after C++17, or the name of a stack variable. And then we can think about what's possible. So those are the rules. Then we actually have to have the opportunity to do it. So sometimes you can't, you can't do it um, if there's no opportunity to. If, if you're not actually constructing the thing, then you can't construct it in place. Uh, if it's not of the right type, you can't construct the thing of the wrong type in a slot for a different type. And if you just don't know enough at the time when you're constructing, to get it done. So here's some examples of this. Here's a function that can't RVO because what it's returning is what has been passed. Uh, this is a fairly famous example. You can't RVO on function parameters. This is quite well known because you don't construct them. Uh, but you still get a move since C++11. Here's another famous example. Stood move in a return statement is almost always an error. There are a few cases when you're writing value wrappers and things like that, you will generally know them when you, when you, when you are doing that. Uh, but of course, stood move gives you a R-value reference. That's a different type from the thing you're returning. No RVO for you. And an example of the third case is, you just don't know enough to RVO. If at the time you have to construct the thing you're returning, you don't know, uh, you don't know which thing you're returning, like here, there's no possibility that you could construct it in place. All right, now I know it's late on a Thursday. Um, I'm just gonna ask you some questions. And they, if they see, seem, seem simple, they are. So just shout out, will this RVO? Yes, yes. yes we're returning a temporary, that's plain. 
Good. All right, how about this? No. Yeah. No? Yes. Yep, yep, this, this, is, this is still returning a temporary, and this works, you know, returning a temporary is in general much more reliable than returning a named thing. It generally works even in debug builds. How about this one? No, no, it's a function argument. You're not constructing it. No opportunity to do so. How about this? Yes, yes in both cases, because you're returning an R value. In the, in the bottom line, you're returning just a, a temporary that you make. And in the top line, it's a temporary formed by the function call. You can RVO right down the, you can like copies down the call stack. How about this one? Yeah, this is an interesting one, isn't it? So it depends on your compiler. <laughs> this is an optimization opportunity that Clang can see and GCC and MSVC can't at the moment. So it, it, in the case where B is true, it's not required. And I guess in the case where B is false, maybe it is required. It's a, this is a mix of cases, isn't it? But basically, Clang, Clang does this, GCC and MSVC can't see this one. Um, this is the same as the previous one, except I hoisted the construction out of the if. And this is, uh, none of the compilers can see this. But, you know, maybe someday they might because there is opportunity here. Okay, how about this one? No, somebody said no. We're not returning the name of a variable. And in fact, we're not returning a thing of the right type because uh, the ternary operator in this case will produce a thing of, uh, an L, uh, produce an L value reference. So actually, we have to copy here. We can't even move. Um, so this definitely defeats RVO, and you don't even get the move. So yeah, and it's it's against the rules. <laughs> so, somebody said C++ is garbage. <laughs> I heard something. Uh, how about this one? This is similar to the previous one. Yes, this time, both sides of the ternary operator are R values. So the overall type of the ternary operator returns an R value. We get copy elision. We're returning a temporary. No? Yeah. Yes, yeah. This is plain named RVO. This is, you, you name the thing, you return the thing. All the compilers are fine with that. How about this? This is a trap for the for the experts. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you put parens around the S and it turns it into an expression, which is an L value reference, which is a different type. But the standard specifically says that you're allowed to do that. However, GCC fails to do this if you're telling it to use a standard after C++ 11. If you tell it to use a standard C++ 11, it does it. I think this is a bug or a regression in later standards for GCC. Sorry, yes. Is there a valid reason to write such a code? No, I do not recommend. <laughs> there is no, so I do not recommend putting your return values in parens. Outside of very specific use cases that you might have, but in general, no. There is no valid reason to do this, really. And Finally, this is a little different. Again, if you ever write code like this, I'm not going to let you through code review. But everything here is const expra. And in the case where we get a construct, we'll return zero. In the case where we get a move, in this case, we'll return one. Anyone know whether we'll return one or zero? Will we get the construct or will we, will we not? It looks like we should get zero, but again, the standard Actually, the standard says you, you don't get copy elision in context for contexts. Uh, that's not maybe something that will happen forever, but currently that's what the standard says. And 
So this depends on what you write. Uh, this depends on p, right? If you put const expr p, no. If you put const p, probably no. If you put auto p, it depends on how aggressive your compiler is about putting things in context expr context. GCC is very aggressive. You will always get the move here with GCC. Clang less so. If you make it not const, you get the, you get the in place. If it's const, you get the move. So please don't write code that relies on observing this distinction. <laughs> OK. I told you that I saw lots of code really trying to, trying to be, uh, you know, trying to take advantage of this. This is an example of code that really tries its best to uh, get efficiency. And it's really doing, it is getting an efficiency, but it's, it's doing too much. Uh, it's applying std move to the result of a function call. Well, that's an R value anyway. And it's, you know, it could be simpler, more simply rewritten as just returning the result of the function. In fact, the std get of the result of the function. OK, before we continue, question, yes? Right. In this case, unsigned long, long, you know, a move or a copy or whatever doesn't matter. That's true. Can you repeat the question, please? It was more of a comment that, that the unsigned long, long, it doesn't really matter in this case whether we get the copy or move. But the, the visual noise in trying to understand what this function does with the stood move and the extra line, I think is worth trimming down. Because, you know, in this case, it's an unsigned long long, but someone sees this, they copy the pattern somewhere else in the code base it's where it's not an unsigned long long. They apply std move to result of a function call. It's just visual noise. It's not, get, it's not gaining anything. OK. Uh, now, before we continue, if you haven't already thought, um, there will come a point in this talk, fair warning, where you, where you think, why am I programming this language that's so complicated? Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> but hopefully by the end, you, you know, my point in this talk is, uh, actually I don't like default construction. We can get in place construction always, but we just have to jump through a lot of hoops sometimes. Okay. Let's talk about putting stuff into a vector because this is kind of like everyday bread and butter of people's code bases. When should you use pushback? When should you use in place back? Let's try and avoid the tendency of thinking that in place back is magically better than pushback. So this is what in place back and pushback look like. Uh, the, the signatures that is from C plus plus seventeen in place back returns a reference. Prior to seventeen, it returns void. And you can see that pushback is overloaded on L value and on R value references. So. With that in mind, which of these, and imagine that these are happening either or, because I know you shouldn't stood move something and then move it again, right? Well, then use it again even. Um, but which of these, are these, are these any different? Yeah. No. Yes. Practically, no. Right? Practically, no. Um, the, to the person who said yes, yes, if you're in C++17, that's the difference. You can capture a reference to the thing that was that was uh, in place backed, in placed back. I don't know which whichever way around you say that. <coughs> okay. Now there's a difference, yes, because the, and this is the whole point of in place back, as we know. What we're passing is a const char star. It's not an R value reference to a string or an L value reference. In place back is doing the job it's supposed to do. It's constructing in place from the arguments forwarded to the constructor of string. Now, at this point, you know, there are some people who say, well, just always use in place back because it's strictly more powerful than pushback, right? Some of you might even say that. And I would say to those people, I don't like that view. I, because, so I don't log into my computer as root. I like to use the, <laughs> I like to use the least powerful thing that's available to me. And this isn't just a philosophical point of view. Uh, this helps the reader of my code. Because if they see me using pushback, that's, that's, saying, that's me saying to them, 
I know I'm going to get a move here. I know I'm going to get a copy here. I can't do any better. My code is confident, in the words of Kate Gregory. And if I use in place back, that's me saying, I'm actually trying for an in place construction. I know what in place back does, and I'm using it because I need its power. So that's why I prefer to use pushback when that's all I need. All right, so of course, in placeback takes a parameter pack. So one of the other useful things you can do with it is to do uh, default construction, right? Which you which you can't otherwise. Um, parameter pack can be empty. That's sometimes useful. And because it takes a parameter pack and perfectly forwards its args, it can also uh, it can also take advantage of explicit constructors. So if you remember that class S that has all the noisy stuff about the special member functions, it has an explicit constructor from int. We can't push back an int because that's pushback, you know, can't implicitly construct, it has to implicitly construct at the call site because it's looking for an S and you can't implicitly construct from an int, but in place back works. Okay. Now we've got, we're trying to copy an array of arguments to S's constructor and, and make an array of, uh, or a vector of S's. What's gonna happen here? This is typical code again. I've seen, I've seen you know, a transform or a copy, something like that, uh, trying to make type, type of one thing from type, type of another thing. What's actually happening here? Back inserter is gonna call push back, right? So for each of these three things, we're going to get a construct, a move, because it's an R value, you're gonna trigger the R value overload of pushback, a destruct of the temporary that you constructed, and, and each of, that's gonna happen three times, right? So you're getting an extra move, you're not getting in place construction. So how can we get in place construction? Question. Yes. Um, given that we're using constant iterators, uh -huh. would, wouldn't we get the copy rather than the move? Uh, yes. Okay. Given that we're using C begin and C end here, uh, we will get. Yes, you're right. We will get a copy. Uh, and uh, uh, no, no, no. We won't get a copy because we'll get because it, we're not copying arg. We're not moving arg. We're using arg to construct the s, and the temporary s then gets moved. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, so what happens, so, so that works, but it's not efficient. What happens if we have an array of ints? Now it doesn't work, because as we saw before, there's no way to implicitly construct an s from an int, that constructor is explicit. So push back, back inserter can't do that, it can't push back. So what do we do? Stick in a lambda, right? <laughs> Again, I see this in code all over the place. Um, and now we're like, well, that's great. You know? And this, this works, with, and it's doing the same thing as before, basically. Construct, move, because the lambda RVOs, so we get, the, we get the R value, we get the move, and unfortunately, we can't do better than that with, with back inserter because the library doesn't have back in placer. Here's a sketch of it. I mean, in, in reality, uh, these kind of iterators have a few more things that they, they might have, but these are the essential parts. If you need a back in placer, this basically works. So instead of calling pushback, it's assignment operator will forward the arguments just like in place does, and it'll call in place back. And then, and then you, if you're prior to C++ 17, you give it the maker function, or you give it the uh, deduction guide if you're on 17. And now the compiler's happy, and now this achieves in place construction. Because in place, it just does in place. We don't get any default constructs, or, or we don't get any temporary constructs, we don't get moves, we just get in place construction. Good, that problem is solved. All right, 
here's another snippet of code. And, uh, you know, I, we, could, we could say a few things wrong with this code. It's actually got a few things wrong with it, right? So a vector of string view, okay. String view, we're calling std move on a string view before we pass it to in place back. That's, well, for a start, string view is probably a value type. Uh, we want value semantics on string view because it's, gen, it's just a pointer and a length. Um, the std move is superfluous in either case. And if we're calling in place back, shouldn't we just pass stuff into in place back? <coughs> it's the kind of code I've seen. In place back, uh, if you're calling in place back, it's a code smell to be explicitly asking for the thing to be constructed at the call site. Because that's, <laughs> that's just kind of wrong. Um, if you want the thing to be constructed, what you're passing to in place back had better construct it, because that's the job of in place back, right? So don't explicitly call a constructor at the call site when you're using in place back. <clears throat> All right, sometimes, sometimes we use vectors of pairs as maps. So we know how to construct a pair. But what if the the mapped type, i.e. the second argument, the second part of the pair, has a multi-argument constructor. This kind of code is very common. You know, either pushback or in placeback do the same thing here. You are explicitly asking for value to get constructed. So you're going to get value constructed, funnily enough, and you're going to get a, a construct, a move, and then, in fact, you, you're going to get a temporary construction, move into the pair, pair gets moved into the vector, right? So you can get struct, construct, two moves. You don't need extra moves. So, but what do you do if your second argument of your pair needs a multi-arg constructor? Anyone? Yes, piecewise construct. So pair has this piecewise construct constructor. So it's basically a tag type, uh, and it's of type piecewise construct t, and there's a value which is spelled piecewise construct, and then you forward as you forward the arguments through a tuple that will use to be used to construct the first of the pair and the second of the pair. <coughs> so this is where you're starting to think C++ is verbose. <laughs> but this is what you have to do if you want to achieve in-place construction. You, you call, you're, you're in placing, you're constructing a pair in place. So you need to give the arguments for pairs constructor, which are the piecewise construct and the forwarding the things to your actual first and second constructors. And it's, it's verbose, and I know slideware is not particularly compelling, but C++ is about no distributed fat, right? So. When you need it, you need it, and you can achieve in-place construction. Okay, so that's about it for vector. And uh, here are my recommendations for vector. As I said, pushback is perfectly fine for our values, and it's confident code, and it's telling the reader, I don't need the power of in-place back. Um, and, and the anti-pattern here is asking for an explicit construct when you use in-place back. So look out for that one. All right, let's briefly say a few things about initializer list. William Shakespeare got it right. So when you write initializer in initializer list, it's as if you wrote a const array and then a view into that array. And that const is important. So I discovered this, and I was a little confused with it at the start. This, anyone know what's happening here? In the, so it works fine. The, the one that works fine is fine. And then there's another one that works fine until it explodes. Do you see why? Well, it's undefined behavior, which is to say it probably works fine, right? Um, because in F, in F, there is a local variable of type const int array, right? And that's what's being returned is a view into that local variable. 
So that's a, we know that's a bad thing. Views, returning views into local variables, that's dangling, right? Except that if that, the compiler knows that thing is const, and it might just put it in your static data segment, and it's fine for the life of your program. <laughs> I'm making the initializer list in F. That's exactly as if I had written const array of int is this is a bunch of ints, and then I'm returning the view into that local const array. So I'm returning a, a stack variable, except that the compiler may, because that thing is const, make it live for the lifetime of the program. This is still undefined behavior, but the compiler might, might you know, do the do the wrong right thing. <laughs> okay, so initializing list also has const storage. This also means, as you probably know, that you can't put move only things in initializer list. It just, it just doesn't work. Um, you can find ways around it by faking initializer list and basically declaring what, what it would be yourself, taking the const away. But you say, or the engineers on your teams say, Initializer list is so convenient. Why can't I? I'd much rather write a one-liner that everyone can read rather than, you know, this this horrible verbiage. <coughs> so, I mean, you can make it a bit better. You <laughs> you get you can turn copies into moves, like I said a couple of slides ago, but it's it's not that great. To be honest, initializer list is a bit broken. Um, there is. A proto proposal by Cybrand and Christabella co-authoring. I I don't think I don't know when this is going to hit a mailing near you. Um, maybe not soon. Uh, that, but it would be nice if Vector had an in-place constructor. Maybe. The worst example of this kind of abuse I've seen is something like this: a massive initializer list uh, of strings, and this is just this is incurring for every one of these things. You know, construct, copy, because you can't move out of initializer lists when you know when you when where well, you actually need to use this. Uh, Jason Turner has a great talk about initializer lists. I'm not going to say much more about them other than that just they're broken. There is a there is a um, kind of caveat. I highly recommend watching his talk because um, there is a caveat uh, around strings. Strings mess with our intuition. We, we, we think about, you know, delay construction as late as possible, delay allocation as late as possible. If we have, and, and typically when we're constructing strings, we have like const char star, right? So at the point where that's declared, the compiler knows the length of that. And if it can capture it in a string or a string view, it can continue to know the length of that. But as soon as that char star decays, as soon as that char array deca decays to a char pointer, sometime later down the call stack, it's going to have to call strlen. And that means that um, various things might be faster or slower. Uh, I don't think I have time to show you this. This is in Jason's talk. But just be aware that strings mess with your, your mental model of how, how fast construction is or should be. OK, so recommendations for initializer list. Pretty much only use them for literal types, I think. Use them for ints, use them for floats. They're fine for that. Anything else, I don't really have a good recommendation for initializer list. There's not many good answers. So first point and last point, stand. What if, what if the result is const? What if the result is const? There is, is the there just, I mean, is, if there's the move doesn't happen, just the compiler just inline on that? Uh, like if you make a const and all the magic, it just puts the definition of the constructor. If you make everything const, I'm not sure. Your mileage may vary. I, either way, I wouldn't really advocate using initialized list for, for, for more than like register types. All right. Let's talk about putting stuff into a map. This is where it gets a whole lot more complicated, I'm afraid. And when I say map, I mean any of the standard associative containers, so set, unordered set, map, unordered map, multi-maps, things like that. They all have very similar interfaces, and more so, their interfaces also are likely to, uh, you know, be, be similar interfaces to any non-standard maps you might use because people tend to copy the standard. So it's perfectly possible to initialize a map with an initializer list. Is it good? 
How many constructs, copies, and moves are we getting here? Remember, we've got a map of S, and that's got an implicit constructor from arg. We're getting, I actually forget how many. I think we're getting two extra moves. Again, the same as we saw in the vector case. Initialize this stuff is from the same. In fact, sorry, we're getting a copy, right? Because it's initializer list. You can't move out of initializer list. <clears throat> now, an alternative to this is something that was presented oh, a few years ago now by Vittorio. Uh, and he presented this for each n args function. It's a function template, and it perfectly forwards its arguments in batches of n to the function that you give it. So, and you can find you can find this function online if you look for it. Uh, it's quite a handy thing to have when you're initializing maps. So you can give it uh, a lambda like this and just tell the lambda to perfectly forward the arguments to the map in place. And then you just give it a bunch of key value pairs as the zero and one here. Are the... And it can call explicit constructors because it's using in place, which can take advantage of explicit constructors. And again, if you need multi-argument constructors for your mapped type. Typically, typically, you don't need them for your key type, but you might need them for your mapped type. Then you can use this lambda with the piecewise construct argument on pair that we saw before. Now, I tried this. Uh, this talk at this point is about, uh, you know, I tried, when I originally made this talk, I was running with VC17, I think. Pair is a tricky thing. Pair is. Ask any standard library implementer. I think actually Louis said it in his talk. Like pair has 18 different constructors and it's horrible. Some of those constructors are conditionally explicit. And when I tried this with VC17, it complained. VC19 doesn't complain now. Um, so just be aware that you might run into some weird error messages with, with pair and conditionally explicit construction. But this ought to work and does work with modern compilers. OK, so we can initialize maps using this very useful for each n args thing. I recommend that. So how about putting things into an existing map? You know, you initialize maps once, but typically you put things in them a lot. Well, if, you're, if you work in code bases like I do, you see a lot of people using just the easy way. How many constructs, move, and copies do we have here, for example? Now, if you know that that thing is already in the map, this is actually not bad, pretty fine. You'll get, you'll get a construct and a move, uh, sorry, a move assign in this case, right? Because the thing's already there. You'll get a construct, a move assign, and a destruct. And if the thing's already there, you can't, you can't do a lot better than that, I think. But if the thing's not in the map, that square bracket operator gives you a default construct. Uh, and interestingly, that, that's pretty much the only method on map that requires your object be default constructable. So sometimes you have objects that you don't want to provide a default constructor because it doesn't make sense. You want to avoid, you want to avoid this. So you can use insert instead. Hello, yes. Uh, yes, yes, you, you, you do need an assignment operator. Uh, it's an assignment, uh, yeah, it's an assignment operator on the mapped type of the pair. Well, I'm saying for the arg. For the arg. <laughs> the S, the S, S has an implicit constructor from arg. Right, but not from int, which is why I have the explicit construction in the first case. <clears throat> so the other thing you commonly see in code base is, is trying to use insert. And this, uh, there are various alternative ways to do this. None of them particularly good, some of which work better than others. So the first case here, you will get, well, first thing to note is if you're asking for an S to be there, you're going to get an S constructed. The, the compiler doesn't elide, like it doesn't do reverse RVO in a, way, in a sense. So you can get the S constructed, you're going to get it moved into the pair and the pair moved into the map in the first case. 
The second case, we're being tricky. So we're saying this is not a pair of int and s, this is a pair of int and s r value ref. So you'll get, again, the s gets constructed, it doesn't get moved because we said this is a pair of, and it's an r value ref, so the pair is going to use that fine. But then the pair gets moved into the map. So we save the move on the second line by trying to be clever. The last line looks like it shouldn't compile, but does, because pair is tricksy and has explicit con or conditionally explicit constructors. And this is one of those times where it actually kind of looks weird, but, but this actually works fairly well. Sorry? Uh, that last line, I believe, let me try here. <laughs> if I click on this, maybe it will work. So, unfortunately, I can't see it. So the first line gave us explicit construct move move, right? Construct move move. Second line, we saved the move. We got explicit construct and one move. Last line, we got in place construct no moves. So although that looks weird and like it shouldn't work, it does in that case. Like I said, pair is very tricksy. Okay, okay, you say, but in, insert, I want to be clever and use in place because insert just looks weird. What's the problem with this? The principal smell here is that we're asking for an S. Like never ask for the thing that you're trying to in place because you want it to be constructed in place. If you just ask for it right there, it's going to be constructed right there, and you'll just get a construct and a move. You won't get an in-place construct. That's exactly the same as we saw before. This is the proper way to use in place, as you probably know. It's going to try and construct a pair directly in place in the map, passing 0 and 1. This gives us in-place construct. <clears throat> Richard. What if your key and values have multi-arguments for their construction? I'm glad you asked that. What if you want to default construct the value of your mapped type? You, you can't just give it one argument. The compiler says none of the two overloads could match all the argument types, right? And it's the same deal if you want uh, multi-arg constructs. Um, well, before you consider that, you can do this for a default construct. <laughs> Don't do this. Um, yeah, I'd really like there to be no discard on operator square bracket. Uh, okay, so if you have a zero R construct or indeed a multi R construct, you fall back to using the piecewise construct on the pair. In this case, a zero R construct. Right, but if you have multi Rs, same deal. Here's an example of where this comes up in real code. Now, here we have a set of client records. Client records have a con constructor that takes these three things. We're replacing it. This is great. This is correct usage, right? Um, this passes code review. Everything is good. Then we want to upgrade the set to a map. Rather than having just a set of client records, we want a map from client IDs to client records or something like that. So the programmer comes in. They say, I know. We'll do this. This now falls into the trap. This is a pitfall, right? This gives us construct. We're asking for it right there. We get a construct, or well, right there. You can't see that one, but <laughs> we're asking for client record. So we get a construct and two moves, just like before. So piecewise construct is what you need. So it, it, it's verbose, but you know there's always a way to get in-place construction. But it's so easy to let a, a change like that pass by in code review and you know, accidentally incur cost. What do you do if you want to emplace the result of a function call? Right? It, it, so it's quite complicated to construct one of these things maybe. You want to call a function to do it. The problem is in C++, Function arguments get evaluated before we call the functions, right? So this argument, which is get s, that function is going to get called. We're going to get an s there. An r value, yes. But we're going to get a construct and move. We cannot avoid that. We can't avoid that function being called. But 
we can control, the only thing we can control pretty much is the result, when the result of that function call becomes an S. And this is something that Arthur has blogged about and Andre Kshiminsky. Uh, so this is a little wrapper that wraps a function. Uh, it, it captures your function and it has a conversion operator to the result type of the function. So when you call it, um, it, will, it will not create the S right there. But when the map wants the S, it's going to trigger the implicit conversion. And here it is in practice. So if your S is complicated to construct or whatever, you can use this with result of, and it will give the map, it will get, it, in place will get the S when it wants it through conversion. Now, again, not particularly nice, but if you need it, you need it. Interesting note, compilers are generally, again, with the most modern compilers I've tried, both of these lines, the one I've commented out is equivalent, both of them optimize for the same thing. But go back in time to MSVC 17, and it's better at optimizing the inline lambda than it is at the function pointer. It doesn't see through the function pointer. So this is a case where lambdas are, are really good. Now in C++ 17, we got another way to put things in a map, insert or assign. So remember I said like operate square bracket works fine if, the if you know the thing's already there, but if you don't know it's there, you get the default construct. So what you need is probably insert or assign, which just does the right thing in either case. Uh, and this is now part of maps interface, or, and, and map and friends, I should say. So, but again, the problem is it can't do explicit construction because look at its signature here, it's taking one thing which is convertible to the mapped type. It's not taking a parameter pack. It's not doing in-place construction like in-place does. It's just doing some kind of conversion. And so if you want to use it with an explicit constructor and get in-place construction properly, you need to do something like this with result of trick. Is everyone happy? No? Good. This is C++. So, in case you're not keeping count, I rewrote this slide so many times. <sighs> Maps interface is screwed up. We have not just, not just five or more different ways of putting things in the map. They're all different kinds of interface styles. Some of them take things to be converted. Some of them take parameter packs. Some of them take pairs, which is the actual value type of the map. And emerge even takes another map to put into a map. Um, so, you know, this is C++ as it is today. And, and you need to do what you need to do. But I highly recommend watching Chandler's talk from, from C++ Now earlier this year, where he describes a much better interface for maps. Maybe we'll have some nice things someday. Okay, so there, there, is, a, there is a light at the end of this tunnel, which is with C++ 20, quite often, maybe, the mapped type, the thing that's the value in your map, not the key, uh, might be an aggregate. And right now, you're kind of screwed before C20 because there is no way to construct the aggregate in place. Right? Aggre aggre but with C20, we're getting parenthesized initialization of aggregates, which means, hopefully, when your standard library implementers get around to it, in place will work with aggregates and you can forward the arguments to construct your aggregate in place with presumably forward this tuple, the same way as we've seen. All right, so recommendations for constructing things in place in a map are complicated. Uh, and all of these things. <laughs> so remember about the piecewise construct argument of pair, um, or just use a non-standard map with a better API. All right, now the picture gets better. So, Michael, yes. Oh, right, I didn't cover try in place. Is it in this slide? Uh, try, yeah, no, it's not in this slide. It was in the last one? Yes, I, I didn't mention it here because it pretty much, I think I've covered all of the, 
all of the different use cases. Try so try in place. Um, tries like it says tries to in place a thing and doesn't do anything if it's not there. It's 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 like insert or assign except it doesn't assign in a sense. Um, but its usage is very similar to in place, which is why I didn't really call out a bunch of things about it. So the reason why I mentioned it is because try in place if it does does do the in place, it'll actually do the thing that you have in the in the forward slash. Like it'll actually do. Yes. The right. Right. Try in place takes the parameter pack just like in place. And so it can do construct, yes. But my point, my point is, try and place will take key and key and parameter, parameter pack, and yes. Yes, but it still can't construct an aggregate because you can't construct an aggregate. Yeah, with I, I understand yes. Saying, like, that's, that's oh, right, right. My point is oh, I is see, I see, I see. Right, right, right. So try and place will. Effectively, be a shorter version of this because try, try and place takes the parameter pack. I see what you're saying. Yes, that's that's true. So it can be a shortcut for in place. I think you're implying. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. There's maybe some light at the end of the tunnel then. Uh, let's talk in the brief time we have remaining about putting stuff into other things. Optional, variant, any. The picture is in general better here because these things were born in a land where everything was already modern. Optional and variant and any all have this similar to the piecewise construct. Also, they have a tag type uh, constructor which takes this in place argument. Uh, and in the case of variant, uh, you get a choice over over whether you're constructing. Uh, type-wise or index-wise, and all all of them f perfectly forward their arguments, and you get nice in-place construction. So that's great. Uh, in the case of optional, you you do need to be a little uh, you know the the second thing here is you know how we might normally declare and construct a thing uh, in the code base. Uh, but the but the third one is really the one you want to use, I think. Um, in the second case, again, you're asking for an S right there, so you're going to get the construct and then the move, rather than the equivalent of in place by using the in place tag constructor. When it comes to optional assignment, I recommend optional in place, which is curiously named now that I think about it, because that normally means construction. Here it means assignment uh, or replacement. It's a very similar story. Again, in the second case, you're asking for an S right there, so you're going to get a construction and then a move, which you don't, you know, which isn't optimal. So please use the in-place T constructor for optional and the mplace uh, method and uh, avoid Explicit, like like in like in every case, avoid explicitly constructing the thing that you want to put in, because if you're asking for explicit construction, that's what you'll get. Uh, yeah. Make optional. Yes. As calling the the yes the third one here. Uh, yes. Yes. Make optional is an alternative. Yes. Uh, that's optional. Variant is somewhat similar. So again, we get it's fine to have an implicit constructor. You know that's in that's fine. But the explicit constructor again, you want to avoid saying that. Um, and you can use and and there's the chance here that you will accidentally get a, a change in the code which will like do the thing that you didn't need or didn't want. So this was actually a bug. You're trying, you're trying to construct an S, not realizing that it's an explicit constructor and you're getting an int in this third case. Uh, so my recommendation is, again, to use the in-place constructors, the in-place tag constructors for variant. Do we have make variant? I'm not sure. There's no make variant. No. Thank you, Michael. Um, so again, there's, the in-place has a, a type-wise thing or an index-wise thing. I generally prefer to use the typewise uh, ver uh, I shouldn't, 
uh, alternative, let's say that instead of variant. The typewise alternative, uh, unless I have a variant with the type in multiple places, which is fairly rare. Some people don't like that. I don't mind it, but it's, but it's pretty rare. And for variant assignment, uh, again, a very similar story to optional. And again, the implicit, con the, the explicit construction from int isn't going to be what you want on the last line here. Yeah. Now, there's a semi-famous danger with variant, which is that prior to C++20, it can do narrowing assignments and conversions to bools. So, you have a variant of a bool and a string. <laughs> you're trying to construct a string, probably, when you give it hello. But what you're actually doing is constructing a, a bool, because it says, oh, I know, that's a const car pointer, and I can convert that to true. <laughs> so this prints index is zero. Thankfully, in C++20, this is fixed because we, we get P0608, a sane variant converting constructor, which prohibits narrowing conversions and conversions to bool. So this, this will work as intended in 20. And it's a very similar story for variant as it was with optional. We get in place. This time again, in place takes the, the tag type or the, the Sorry, the template parameter, which is either the, the type or the index. <clears throat> so, similar recommendations for variant. Uh, always be explicit about the types you're creating or in placing. Use the, use the in place type or the in place index constructors. Use in place. And in general, I would avoid the assignment operator unless you're actually assigning variant to variant. Because you don't, you just don't want to, you know, get implicit constructions and all that sort of thing. You want to be sure about what you're getting. So, to sum up, <coughs> think about when you're writing code that 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 create, puts things into things. Think about what you're getting. Think about whether you're asking for an explicit construct right there. That's usually not what you want to do if you want in-place construction. Um, in-place construction, as far as I know, is always possible, but often verbose. And uh, you know, you need to know how RVO works and everything like that to take advantage of it. You can always check small examples on Compiler Explorer. Know the interfaces of containers, especially map, because its interface is really complicated by now. Um, and you know, don't be afraid to use pushback. If you're actually going to get a copy or a move, you don't need the power of in place back. I would recommend just using pushback. It's going to be easier for people to understand and it, and it uh, conveys confidence in your code. And yeah, watch Jason's talk about initialize a list because it is problematic. Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, yes, please approach the mic for questions and they'll be recorded. Uh, do you think the... Um, it's on. All right. Do you think that um, uh, Clang and other tools will help us find cases where we're assigning that has a copy to a um, variant that could be replaced by in place at some oh, point? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Yes, that might very well be possible. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Uh, hi, are there any limitations on the type of object being RVO? Can, like, does it have to be trivial or can it be like a giant inscrutable type and it'll still be RVO'd if I follow the rules? As far as I know, it can be giant inscrutable. Right. Um, you, you probably want to check for named RVO, the Let's say for, for, for returning temporaries, it's much more reliable than returning a named thing in general. Temporaries, almost always RVO, no problem. Named stuff, you definitely probably want to check. Uh, is it possible when you have like the construct move move that the compiler could see through that and bypass it? I don't know. M maybe, but I don't think 
it would require some more standard wording, I think, uh, because at the moment, the compiler is, so the compiler is very limited in what it can do when it comes to changing the results of your code, and copy elision on return is the only place in the standard where the compiler is allowed to change the behavior of what you wrote. Okay. Um, and it's not allowed to do that for passing function arguments yet. Gotcha. Uh, I have two comments. So the first one is about the same converting constructor for variant. Yeah. Uh, so I was just chatting with Eric Facili about this yesterday, and uh, he shared an example where if you have something like variant of float and optional float, okay. and you try to assign that with a double, Without Ooh. the narrowing conversion, it would actually happily construct your optional float because that's a user-defined conversion. Nice. And so I it's not, not quite nice. so sane. Uh, so that's the first comment. So, all right, um, a saner. Yeah. <laughs> to construct them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And all right, second, just don't use assignment with variant. My point stands. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the, second, the second comment is um, about in place. It's more of a question, maybe. Um, for, so, for example, let's say you have a string inside of uh, an optional, right? Right. And we want to do assignment uh, into that string as opposed to, like, reconstructing one because, let's say, you have enough buffer allocated. Okay. And place will actually destroy your yeah, existing string I and see. construct a new one, mm -hmm. right? So, in order to forward the assignment, you actually need to use the assignment, uh, not necessarily on the optional, but, yeah. you know, you could do star you, O equals star to, row, yeah. to do the actual... Um, Assignment through to the to the stored thing. Um, for variant, I think we actually should add a like explicit assign function um, because mm -hmm. what you want is to be able to say like assign to the string some value, right? Right. And so rather than doing end place, I think adding an assign function should be the thing to do for variant. Yeah, that that sounds reasonable. Thanks. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.